Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, welcome to the South Center Conference on the State of the Global Economy and Reflections on Recent Multilateral Negotiations. You are most welcome. This will be a two-day conference, and today, of course, is uh, day one. We have an exciting program, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the chair of the South Centre, which, of course, all of you know, President Benjamin Mkapa, the former president of Tanzania and the dynamic leader of the South Centre. I'm Martin Kaur, I'm the executive director, so I'm so pleased to uh, introduce you to my boss. <laughs> and he will uh, now conduct the meeting. He will also chair uh, the first session, uh, Mr. Mkapa. Thank you, Edi. It's with great pleasure that I open this conference. The com well, okay. It gives me great pleasure to open this conference. It is taking place in conjunction with the meetings of the board and the Council of Representatives, which we are both completed yesterday, and I dare say completed very successfully. I take this opportunity on behalf of the board to thank members of the South Centre for their attendance at the annual reception of the board two days ago, particularly the high level of attendance. It has uh, given us a great deal of uh, heart to carry on with the task. One of the roles of the Centre is to provide timely policy research and to convene meetings on key issues relevant to developing countries. Keeping in mind this role, this, organized, this conference has been organized with two themes, the state of the global economy and reflections on multilateral negotiations. On the first theme, it is of grave concern to our developing countries that the global economy appears certain to go into a downturn and probably a recession that may last longer than the last recession. We hope we can consider what the implications are for developing countries of this prospective downturn. Are we able to decouple from the developed economies and still have good and sustainable growth? Or is decoupling a myth that may only lull us into complacency. I look forward to hearing the views of experts gathered here for the first two sessions who will answer these questions. Further, I hope that they can also provide us with good ideas on how different developing countries will be affected in their different ways. More importantly, however, whether some of our countries have to alter their export markets, their economic models, and their development strategies, and how this can be done. Moreover, how do we go about pressurizing for changes to the global financial and economic institutions that so far have been inadequate, inadequate to the responsibilities and tasks they were created to discharge and to fulfill? We have assembled an excellent team of experts, including the center's chief economist, some of our board members, as well as leaders of the International Labor Organization. To my, to my right, you can see Juan Somavia, and Angtad to help kick off the discussions on these issues. The second theme of the conference is to reflect on current multilateral negotiations. The areas we will discuss are the forthcoming UNCTAD 13 conference, the WTO negotiations that will resume after the eighth ministerial conference last December, the climate change negotiations, and also Rio plus 20, if time permits. Some of our experts and researchers from the South Center will help facilitate the discussion on these subjects by providing their analysis. <coughs> 
We are grateful to many ambassadors and officials of many delegations that are deeply involved in these negotiations who have agreed to join us to provide their perspectives on these negotiations and to outline the way forward. The South Center believes in the importance of the South to be able to negotiate well, and this requires sound preparation, good negotiating skills, and South-South coordination of positions. It is quite clear and widely acknowledged that the developed countries have more resources and greater capacity, and therefore always have an advantage, which is pretty unfair to the developing countries in these negotiations. The developing countries, on the other hand, especially the poorer ones, are always at a disadvantage and are often exploited and pressurized to sign on to agreements that they do not have the opportunity to fully participate in drawing them and whose outcome they have not deeply pondered. The situation has improved greatly in recent years, but the imbalances still remain. It is for this reason that this conference is focusing on these three or four areas of current negotiations for us, the developing countries, to reflect upon. The negotiations, whether on trade and WTO and the EPAs, or on climate change, or even on Act 13, are very complex indeed. But there has also emerged a pronounced unhealthy trend for some developed countries to block progress in the negotiations by raising questions as to whether emerging developing countries are still developing countries. Certain emerging so-called developing countries are still developing countries. This notion is a frontal attempt to deny developing countries their rights and are also attempts to divide developing countries. And unquestionably, it is threatening the functioning of multilateral cooperation. <coughs> We need to reflect on these un un underlying unhealthy trends and to address them, even as we discuss the intricacies of the specific negotiations on UNCTAD, on WTO, on EPAs, and on climate change and sustainable development. I wish you all, speakers and participants, experts and diplomats, a very exciting two days ahead of us. Thank you for your attention. And now I give the floor to Martin Kaur for an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to briefly uh, bring you through the sessions that we will be having uh, so that uh, we, we set the kind of framework for the discussion. As the uh, Chairman has said, we have two major themes that we think are preoccupying the minds of our policymakers and also our civil society in the South. The first, of course, is <clears throat> what is happening to the global economy. Are we in for bad times? Are we able to decouple? Can we answer some of these questions? And do we need alternative development strategies, as our chairman has put it? And we hope that uh, these questions will be discussed in the first session on the downturn in the world economy. We didn't call it a recession because it is an emerging recession, but whether it will be a real recession is something that uh, perhaps in this session uh, our experts are going to discuss. And of course, we are not interested in this uh, only from an academic, scientific point of view. We are principally interested in this issue as to what the prospects are going to be for our developing countries and how they can address this big issue, both at the level of reform of the international system, which we have been talking about for decades, but perhaps we are nearer the reform or not. And if not, then the consequences for developing countries will be even more severe. What can the developing countries do in the absence of multilateral cooperation to face the new economic crisis? And do they need to 
re-examine their existing development strategies. Here we are mindful that uh, we don't have just something called developing countries. There are different categories of developing countries that will be affected in different ways. Some are commodity dependent, some are dependent on exports for manufacturers, and some are dependent on one another as well, and not just on the north. So we hope that uh, our uh, panel of uh, experts, Ilma Sakius, who is the chief economist of South Centre, Yuan Somovia, who, as we all know in this town, uh, is the champion of uh, not only the workers, but also the South in his uh, long career. Yuan, we see you on CNN almost every week, either at the G20 or in Davos or in the ILO. So we are very happy you are able to share your wisdom with us. Mr. Li uh, Shaozing, who is the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of uh, the National Congress in the People's Republic of China, and he was a foreign minister for many years, a board member of the South Center, will share with us the perspective from China. Uh, Mr. Superchai, the Director General, Secretary General of Angtad, unfortunately, he's not able to be with us, but his uh, deputy, Petko Draganov, who has just arrived, will be giving us the view from the UNCTAD leadership on this key issue. And Professor Deepak Nair, who is uh, <clears throat> a board member of the South Centre, a very distinguished economist, one of the leading economists from the developing world, uh, will give us his profound thoughts on this issue. At 12.30, we will also launch the new book by the South Centre. It's called Financial Crisis and Global Imbalances, a Development Perspective. This book is a collection of research papers by the South Centre, written by its chief economist, and we are very happy to, uh, to uh, have the launching of this book with brief comments by Yuan Samovia, by uh, Rubens Ricupero. Many of you may be excited to see Rubens, who for many years was sitting on this podium on behalf of UNCTAD, uh, now he is a board member of the South Centre, so we are reintroducing Rubens into the Geneva diplomatic community, and he will help us to launch the book, as well as be a key speaker in the second session, <coughs> where we will continue the conversation of the first session by looking at how the global economic situation impacts on developing countries as a whole. This will be a key speech by Rubens Ricupero, but I have also uh, told him that we would like him to give <coughs> his view on the current situation in the WTO, but more importantly, on the future of the multilateral trading system. Because, as you know, he is an expert on this issue, having negotiated the Uruguay Round on behalf of Brazil, but also helping the developing countries through the difficult uh, icebergs before the Doha round uh, was launched in his capacity as UNCTAD Secretary General. We also have Charles Soludu, a board member of the South Centre, former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, and one of the top experts uh, from Africa and the developing world, both on the international architecture but on how the crisis may or may not affect Africa. Nagesh Kumar, who is the chief economist of uh, ASCAP and who organized a very important meeting of central bank governors and finance ministers in Manila in September last year. We have been cooperating with uh, ASCAP in sensitizing our governments in Asia on the issue of the crisis and how to address it. And Mr. Lim Mahui, who is a uh, top uh, financial and economic analysts from the Asian region. Both will give the Asian perspective. And then we, we are happy to have Alfredo Calgano, who is the head of macroeconomics in uh, Angtad, to give us a perspective on how the crisis may affect uh, Latin America.
We then have three sessions on multilateral negotiations, the first being on UNCTAD 13 at the end of today, where we have two speakers, one from the UNCTAD Secretariat, who has been uh, involved in the UNCTAD 13 uh, preparations, Richard Kozelwright, and uh, Mr. Vice Yu, who is from the South Centre, who has been following the UNCTAD 13 negotiations and providing advice to developing countries. This is a very topical issue because UNCTAD 13 is the flagship event uh, and negotiations based in Geneva this year. On the second day, we have an exciting session broken into two parts on the WTO. Uh, the first session is on what happened at MC8, what do we expect uh, this year in the WTO and beyond this year. What is the future of negotiations in the Doha issues and the non-Doha issues uh, for the WTO this year? And we have a panel of uh, eminent ambassadors from a range of developing countries, from China, India, uh, Bangladesh, who coordinates the LDCs, Mr. Aga, who of course represents Nigeria, but also is the General Council uh, President in the WTO and who led the process in MC8. Faisal from uh, South Africa, uh, Ambassador Lumanga from Tanzania, a very strong voice from Africa and the LDCs, and Angelica Navarro uh, from uh, Bolivia. We then have a perspective of experts. Uh, myself, Mr. Raghavan, who many of you know, is, uh, has been the chronicler of uh, pre-WTO and the WTO until today. We are very happy that Mr. Raghavan can join us to share his views. And Carlos Correa, who is our special advisor on technology and intellectual property rights issues, will give us an overview of uh, the state of negotiations on intellectual property, not only in WTO, but also uh, in other fora. And the final session will be on the climate change negotiations. This, as you know, uh, has been a very major part of the negotiating uh, arena. In the last uh, few years, we just completed the Durban uh, meeting in which uh, a new process called the Durban Platform has been launched, a new round of negotiations that will see the phasing out of the Bali Action Plan and the phasing in of a new Durban Platform. Uh, what is this all about? There's quite a confusing picture as to what happened in Durban, and our panel of experts will try to uh, give us an analysis we have Minakshi Raman from the Third World Network, who has been following the negotiations very intensely. Our own expert in the South Centre, Vice Yu, who will give us uh, a legal interpretation of the Kyoto Protocol, part of the negotiations, plus the Durban platform. We have uh, Dita Smuller, who coordinates the G77 and China in the ad hoc working group on LCA, that is in charge of the Bali Action Plan. And finally, Aisa Tayab, who was elected in Durban to be the chair of the ad hoc working group on long-term cooperative action, that is the working group in charge of the Bali Action Plan. He will be able to join us tomorrow as well to give us his perspective, either from Saudi Arabia's point of view or as the new chair of this ad hoc working group. So this will be a very exciting uh, session for those of you who want a quick update from the experts on what's <laughs> happening in the climate negotiations. And finally, we'll have some closing remarks for, the, for, the, for 15 or 20 minutes. So it's a very exciting uh, program, and I hope that uh, all of you will be able to stay for the whole two days. Please uh, ask your colleagues to come as well. Uh, alert your ambassadors that uh, we are having a very exciting time. And for those of you who stay on for the launch of the South Centre new book, uh, good news, you will each be given a copy free. <laughs> <laughs> this book will be on sale at uh, 30 francs later at the UN Bookshop. But if you want extra copies from the single copy that you will be getting, 
you can buy it at 10 francs only today for extra copies for your colleagues who don't turn up. So you will get an, oh, please don't handphone your colleagues and uh, you'll have 300 people here for the launching. <laughs> we only brought about 80 to 100 copies of the book. Thank you very much. And uh, I welcome uh, our chairman, Mkapa, to chair the first session. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Let's get started. Our first um, speaker on the theme of instability and downturn in the world economy and the prospects for the South is uh, the Special Economic Advisor of the South Centre, Ilma Zakius. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As Martin mentioned, I'll talk about the prospects of the world economy from the point of view of the European countries. But I'm not just going to look at what's going to happen in 2012. I'll take a longer view and start with this question that if developing countries sudden rise since the beginning of this new millennium is something that is lasting, an important departure from the past trends, or if it is due to some special conditions which may not be repeated or sustained in the future. This rise, and particularly the resilience after the crisis, has given rise to the notion that developing countries are decoupled from the industrial or advanced economies. This is the category of countries, developing and emerging economies, uh, used by the IMF. So for the data purposes, I use that category too. Uh, is it, are they de decoupling? The idea of decoupling actually does not go well with the idea of globalization. That the markets are integrated. In fact, decoupling means that business cycles are no longer correlated. And in fact, this goes against the, against the uh, evidence and the evidence clearly show that business cycles in developed and developing countries are correlated. And in fact, all developing countries went down after the Lehman collapse, uh, even though not as much as the others. But the more important question which I discuss, and in fact, this whole thing will be uh, discussed in much greater detail in a paper that we'll be publishing in a couple of weeks in the South Center. It's under the same title, The Staggering Rise of the South. Whether there is a rise in the trend growth rate of developing countries. If that is the case, even if, even if you go down a bit with industrial countries from time to time, your growth rate will be considerably faster so that you can close the gap, gap with them over time. Now, to answer this question, you need to understand what was driving this sudden rise. Sudden rise. The role of domestic policies and the role of external factors. This is important to avoid complacency because complacency is dangerous. It will expose countries to unnecessary shocks because they will not be prepared. My answer to this question is the, for most developing countries, the global conditions shaped by, shaped by advanced economies and China played much more important role than domestic policy improvements in the rapid rise since the beginning of the decade 
and these conditions are not sustainable. So we are not going to see better days ahead. So we need to do two things. One, start thinking about what to do about the downturn, and secondly, uh, what to do in the long term that our trend growth rate is really shifted up so that we can maintain a large growth gap with the north and therefore close the, uh, close the income gap with those countries. Now briefly, there's an acceleration of growth in developing countries in the new millennium. If you remember the end of 1990s and early 2000, the developing world was in disarray. Asia had just recovered from, or recovering from the crisis, but it was followed by many crises in emerging economies, Brazil, Russia, Turkey, Argentina. There was a dot-com bust in the United States. Japan was in continued deflation, and Europe is, 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 is a sluggish, had a sluggish growth. In the 1980s and 1990s, the growth difference on average between the North and the South was around 1%. And this rose to 5% during 2003 and 2008, not because of slowdown in the North, but because of acceleration in the South. And this is why I asked the question if the trend growth is now, the gap increased further during the crisis in 2008-9 because advanced economies collapsed, not primarily because the downturn, uh, 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 not primarily because uh, the European countries maintained a high growth rate, but the others collapsed, so therefore the gap increased. And for the whole decade, 2002 to 2012, the growth gap was around about 5% per annum, and that is unprecedented, including the so-called golden age. Now, of course, there are all kinds of diversities. Uh, the acceleration was modest in Latin America, very strong in Africa, strong in fuel exporters as a category, strong in Argentina, India, Russia, South Africa, and Turkey, and interestingly, China hardly accelerated in the new millennium. It was growing more or less the same rate as in the 1990s. But in the 1990s, no one thought that China would be, become a major economy capable of challenging US dominance. This happened only when China started running huge surpluses with the US and accumulating large stock of uh, reserves. Otherwise, Chinese growth in the, in the new millennium was not much greater than in the 1990s. Now, as a result of that, the income shares of developing countries in the world increased. And, but there are two income shares. One is in purchasing power parity. The other is in current or constant dollars. And developing countries often refer, and the IMF does too, to the income shared in purchasing power parity. And I think this is extremely misleading. Why? Because countries' contribution to global supply and demand does not depend on purchasing power parity. It depends on the exchange values of the goods and services they provide. And when you look at the shares in purchasing power parity, and it's, uh, it is almost twice the, in some countries like India, the share in current and current or constant. So there is an increase, but let's not exaggerate it. The increase is, 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 is not as much in purchasing power quality in, 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 in current or constant dollar, which actually measures the relative importance of the countries in the world economy. But IMF still continues in measuring growth and, and other things in purchasing power parity because that keeps the growth, global growth rate quite high. Now, coming to the pre crisis global conditions, there were four. First, 
a surge in net capital flows to developing countries. The net inflows are blue, uh, difference between uh, uh, net, inflows, uh, net flows are the difference between inflows and outflows. And this was majorly driven by the same factor that, res that uh, resulted in the subprime bubble. Large liquidity expansion, historically low interest rates in US, Japan, and even in the US, in, in Europe. Second, there was a rapid inflow of remittances, growing 20% per annum to the south. And the amounts were reaching 3% of GDP in India, 11% in the Philippines. So without which, India would have been running for 4 to 5 percent uh, deficits, uh, current account deficits uh, during the expansion time. The third, the third, the massive rise in commodity prices. Uh, I will comment that China made an important contribution to that, but not before, but after the crisis. Well, the reason I will explain. And finally, all these factors were supplemented by U.S. acting as a locomotive to export-oriented economies, U.S. household savings dropping sharply, current account opening up, absorbing large quantities of imports from particularly Asia, but also Latin America in commodities, and therefore acting as a major drive for developing countries. Now, I'm not denying that developing countries made efforts in domestic policies. In fact, in the paper, I explain in what areas and with what impact. There are policy improvements regarding fiscal deficits, current account deficit, debt, inflation, particularly in Latin America, but also Africa. But the external condition I've just described had a very significant and determining impact on the improvement in macroeconomic conditions. The impact of commodity taxes and revenues on budget deficits in, the, in Latin America is recognized by IMF and the Inter-American Development Bank, which both say that structurally budgets actually did not improve in Latin America, except Chile structurally all Latin American countries were in budget deficit. But because of the boom in commodity prices, there were some cyclical elements which made considerable improvement in the budgets. The same in the current account in Latin America and Africa. Without commodity boom, the current account in Latin America would have been in deficit by 4% of GDP, but on average, they were running a surplus of almost 1%. And in fact, when the commodity prices went down sharply for a brief period after Lehman collapse, the current account deficit shot up in Latin America. And success in, in bringing inflation under control was also due partly in some countries to Latin America. Uh, capital flows. In my country, Turkey, as well as in Brazil, because capital flows were in excess of current account deficits, therefore leading to nominal appreciation, providing an anchor on inflationary expectation, working very much like exchange-based stabilization program. Now, what happened to growth fundamentals? Investment savings and productivity. First of all, not all rapidly growing developing countries had rising savings, investment, or productivity. In fact, on average, the middle income country savings rate dropped, on average, according to the World Bank figures. Latin America record before the crisis was pretty poor in savings and investment. And the, the industrialization did not stop in fact, continued with increased reliance on commodity bonanza. In some countries, 
investment and savings actually dropped sharply while growth accelerated. Turkey is a prime example. There was weak investment in high saving Southeast Asian economies, Malaysia, Thailand. Malaysia had 34, 36% savings rate and 16% investment rate. And this raised concern among some economists that Southeast Asia becoming commodity based economy and actually getting stuck in the middle income trap. India had a very strong investment and saving performance. I think that was the most interesting case that we need to study more during the, before the uh, crisis. But in India, uh, show very little progress in industrialization. The share of manufacturing in GDP stay around 15% of 15%, more or less the same level as 1990s, half the level in China. 75% of Indian growth was due to expansion in services. Services, infrastructure remains a major impediment with other things on on on. Uh, uh, manufacturing growth, and there's a concern that if these problems are not resolved, Indian miracle can remain a one-off miracle like we saw in Brazil in the late 60s and 70s, or in Turkey in the 80s. Now, what are the impact of global conditions on growth? We saw the fundamentals and macroeconomic balances. First, for the reason that I already mentioned, commodity prices, US locomotive, capital flows, remittances gave a major boost to developing countries. But at the same time, low interest rates and capital flows allow very accommodating monetary policy in developing countries. Developing countries never had so low interest rates. With some exceptions, like Brazil, and it's for a brief period. So not only that global conditions added to these economies, but allow these economies to pursue expansionary monetary policies. Uh, according to some economic work undertaken in Inter-American Development Bank, half of the growth in Latin America before the crisis was due to exceptionally global favorable conditions. If the unfavorable conditions prevailing after the Russian crisis had continued, Latin America would have been in recession. My own estimates put 30 to 50, 35 to 50 percent of Chinese growth before the crisis due to exports, and mostly to advanced economies. And the other export-led economies in East Asia relied on export for growth even more than China. We are often, we are often told that the expansion in South-South trade, which is taking place in this period, is a sign of decoupling and a reason for acceleration. There is a significant in increase in the South-South trade as a share of North-South trade. You can see it from in the chart. <laughs> now, as well as the share of developing countries in world trade. Let me start with the latter. An important part of the increase in the share of developing countries in world trade is, of course, due to their increased adoption of outward-oriented strategies, importance on trade. But part of it is due to double counting. Because of participation in international networks, and increased participation uh, in international networks, developing countries import a lot for exporting. A lot more than industrial countries. And double counting is in exports is a lot more in the south than in the north. And this is often overlooked. Secondly, much of the intra-south trade, south-south trade, is actually linked to exports to the north. If you look at that, 
a large uh, part of South South trade is intra-Asian trade. Three quarters of South South trade is among Asian countries. China itself alone accounts for 40% of South South trade and 60% of intra-Asian trade and 65% of Asian trade with Africa and Latin America. So if you take China out, there isn't much left in terms of intra-Asian trade. The share of Brazil, India are quite small, and even though their import, uh, import content of their exports are also low. Sixty percent of Chinese imports during the subprime expansion before the crisis came from other developing countries in Asia. Parts and components, and these all ended up, ended up in advanced economies because China has a very high import content of exports. Sixty percent of Chinese imports from other developing countries will use for exports and mostly to advanced economies. As for the other East Asian developing countries, their dependence on US and Europe is even more than China. They are dependent not only to direct exports to these countries, but also indirect exports to China, because 60% of Chinese exports are used, imports are used for export to other countries. Coming on the role of China in the recovery. <coughs> of course, during the expansion before the subprime, China made an important contribution to the rise in commodity prices. Because we always maintain in that in various reports in the past that growth in the south is more commodity intensive than growth in the north. The recovery in developing countries started very quickly around early 2009, when Lehman collapsed, commodity prices went down, growth in the north went down, capital flows went down. So everything that was helping developing countries previously went down. But all of them recovered very quickly in different fashions. Capital flows recovered quickly because of rapid increase in quantitative easing and cuts in interest rates. China and most East Asians gave a very strong counter-cyclical policy response, and commodity prices recovered as a result. Here, the important thing is uh, the role of China in the commodity prices. Before the crisis, China was relying on exports to advance economies for growth, and therefore, China's imports were helping more East Asian countries who were producing manufactured parts and components. After the crisis, China responded with a massive investment program, infrastructure and a property boom, which was a lot more commodity intensive than manufactured exports. So the shift from, by China from export-led to investment-led growth meant a significant increase in Chinese demand for commodities. In fact, as the numbers show on the, on, on the charts, Chinese import of commodity increased by 75%, whereas Chinese import of manufacturing increased by 30%. And this is the major reason the Chinese investment-led boom is the major reason for rapid recovery of Latin America from the crash. Now, coming to the questions of sustainability, 
since the crisis, growth in developing countries, including Asia, is driven by domestic demand. In Asia, more by investment. In other countries, mostly by consumption. As a result, current account deficit rose. In deficit countries, in Latin America, Africa, and surpluses fell in Asia. Brazil and few others, India and Turkey, saw even more rapid increase in deficit because they appreciated their currencies faster than the surplus countries. In fact, these countries, some of these countries, Argentina, Brazil, India, Turkey, and Korea, in the post-crisis period, reached growth rate quite similar to those before the expansion, at least until the end of 2011. And then, two key questions is, is it sustainable? In other words, this pace of pattern, domestic demand led growth, with major contribution from China in terms of investment and property bubble, is it sustainable? Do we need to shift to a different pattern of growth? And, or can we go back to pre-crisis conditions and start enjoying rapid growth on the basis of capital flows, commodity prices, and export to the US? Uh, these are the questions that I'm going to answer, uh, address in the remaining uh, five to six minutes. Now China has been relying since the crisis on investment. And there is a massive increase in Chinese investment, despite some efforts to increase consumption. Today, Chinese consumption as a proportion of income is less than before the crisis, 34%. And the 34% consumption GDP rate, you only expect to see during war times. You don't see that in, I don't know any, any time when in peace times countries have such low consumption rate. The problem with the Chinese efforts to raise consumption is that even though major difficulty was a very low share of household income in GDP, the Chinese policymakers are trying to not increase the share of household income in GDP, but mainly by trying to reduce the propensity to save of household. And they're resisting it because there is a lack of social provision of housing, education, and health, although there's some important steps taken with respect to social housing. Now, if you look at the outlook for the next few years, outlook for Chinese exports are bleak. U.S. consumers are cutting, Eurozone is shrinking, and even if it avoids a recession, for many years to come, Eurozone will not provide a major stimulus to anybody. And Chinese total exports declined for the first time since the crisis in the last quarter of 2011. And this decline is not sick because China cannot go back to 25% growth per annum in export. They did before the crisis. That means the US will again be acting as locomotive, accumulating deficit and debt, debt and that will be the end of the international monetary and trading system. So China cannot see growing, going back to pre-crisis exports, but the current investment driven growth is not feasible either. It's not sustainable either. There is already, already a bursting of the property bubble in China. If the same amount of property investment is made in 2012, that is zero growth for property investment, China is expected to go to something like 6.5% growth in 2012. Uh, some wide expectations put China to 3% for 2015 and 16. 
End of investment boom in China, for the reason I explained, can be end of the commodity boom. Already we have seen decline in commodity prices since summer 2011. And IMF projections, the latest projections, put both oil and non-oil to further declines. Of course, oil, we have the geostrategic problems with Iran and others. It can go the other way around. But certainly, on the basis of current trends, we expect a, a, a further decline in commodity, commodity prices are expected in the coming years. And